Introduction to Sampling and Sampling Methods Statistics relies on sampling to infer something about the population. Let's say we have a population we would like to know something about. Say 17,000 undergraduate students is our population. We use the uppercase N, big N, to represent the population size of 17,000. Now, it would be very time consuming to survey all 17,000 students, so we take a sample. That is a subset of the population, and we use the lowercase n, we will call this little n, to denote the sample size. In this case, little n is 500. This smaller number of 500 students is called a sample, and it should be representative of the population if we're going to use it to infer something about that population. Samples are used to get an idea about what the larger population looks like, and so samples must be representative of the population to be useful. Let's say you've manufactured a large batch of three-quarter inch screws. Now the screws have to be the right diameter to fit into other parts, so you need to check to make sure the screws are really three-quarters of an inch. But you can't examine every single screw that is manufactured. They come off the machine by the hundreds, if not thousands. So how can you know if your screws are up to the specs? The answer is, you take a sample. You take a portion of the screws, and based on the results of the sample, you will infer that the population is similar to the sample, if the sampling is done right. So what's the right way to take a sample? Do you just walk into the factory and scoop up a handful of screws to test first thing each morning? Maybe that would work, but it's likely that the machinery that produces the screws acts up during the day as it overheats or the workers get tired and are not so careful, so the batch of screws you look at in the morning may not be representative of the screws the machine produces over the course of a day. And therein lies the key to all sampling. The word representative is the key word. The sample you take, whether you're sampling screws or tires or people, the sample must be representative of the overall population since you're using it to make inferences about that population. Let's start this discussion of sampling by distinguishing between a population and a sample. A population is the set of all elements under study. Now it's up to the researcher to decide who the population is. That is, what are the elements under study? I can decide to study all the students at Ohio State University, so that would be my population, and it would include all students. I might decide that's too broad, so I want to narrow that down to all students taking 12 credits or more at the undergraduate level. Now I have a smaller population. I can decide to define my population as all undergraduate accounting majors taking 12 credits or more, and now I've narrowed down my population even further. Now that we understand what the population is, that it's defined by the researcher, now let's talk about the sampling frame. A frame is a listing of the population from which we can draw a sample. So if the population is all full-time undergraduate accounting students, then a frame would be a listing of all those students. And we can get that list from the registrar's office. Once we have the list, called a frame, then we can draw a sample from this list, and now we're ready to choose a sampling method. We have a number of choices. To begin, we must decide whether we are going to be using a non-probability method or a probability method to select our sample. A non-probability method is less scientific, but is usually more convenient, cheaper, and quicker than a probability method. We use non-probability methods when we're conducting exploratory research. Probability sampling methods are more rigorous, and they are good for drawing conclusions or making inferences about the population we're studying. When we use non-probability methods, we don't know the probabilities attached to selecting the items, we just select them. There are two main methods of taking a non-probability sample. There are convenience samples and judgment samples. Again, these methods are used when we are conducting exploratory research or pilot studies or where we want to get a quick and dirty reading as a way of knowing the direction a scientific study might lead us. These types of studies are usually followed up with conclusive research using the more scientific probability sampling methods. So we have two types of non-probability samples, 
convenient, and judgment. A convenient sample is exactly what it sounds like, sampling items that are conveniently available. So walking into the factory and scooping up the first handful of screws that comes out of the machine is a convenient sample. Going to the mall and surveying shoppers as they walk by is also considered a convenient sample. Sampling a group of students hanging out in the cafeteria after class is also a convenient sample. These examples have one thing in common. They're all easy and inexpensive to use as a sample. They are convenient. You can probably see why this is not a very scientific approach to sampling. The students hanging around the cafeteria may be different from the students who are rushing off to work or to pick up children from daycare. If you sample the students in the cafeteria, that would be a convenient sample since they are conveniently available. The question is, are they representative of the student population or are they significantly different? If they do not represent the population, then your results may be biased. Another type of non-probability sample commonly used is called a judgment sample. This is where you sample experts in a field and ask their opinion. While they may not be representative of the population, they are very knowledgeable and can give you more information than your typical man on the street. So while you can't generalize the results of a judgment sample, you can use it to structure a more scientific follow-up study. Now let's move on to probability samples. These type of samples are based on known probabilities and are more rigorous than non-probability samples. A probability sample can be used to make inferences about the population under study. The simplest type of probability sample is called a simple random sample or SRS for short. In a simple random sample, every item in the population has the same probability of being selected as all the other items in the population. Let's say, for example, there are 50 balls in a barrel numbered 1 through 50, and 6 will be selected randomly. We can shake the barrel and then pick a ball at random without looking. The ball selected will have a 1 in 50 chance of being selected. And more importantly, every ball in the barrel has an equal and known chance of being selected, 1 in 50. A more sophisticated way of selecting the ball would be to use a random number generator to generate a random number between 1 and 100. This eliminates any human bias in the selection process. You can generate a random number the old-fashioned way by using a table of random numbers, most statistics books have a table of random numbers in the appendix. You can use the table to get random numbers, or you can use a computer program to generate a random number. Excel has a function, rand, to generate random numbers. Another type of probability sample is a systematic sample. In a systematic sample, you use a random number to pick a starting point, and then systematically pick elements at equal intervals until you reach the desired sample size. Let's say you have a population size. Let's use big N to denote the population size. Let's say big N is 1,000. And you want to take a sample of 50 items. So then your sample size, let's use little n to denote the sample size. So little n would be 50. Now to determine the interval you need to reach your desired sample size, you would divide 1,000 by 50 and you get 20. So the interval would be every 20 items. To select the first item, you need to generate a random number from the first 20 items in the population. Say that random number is 17. So the first item sampled would be number 17, and then the next item would be 17 plus the interval of 20, so 37, and then the next item would be 20 more, which is 57, and we would keep going through the population, sampling every 20th item until we get to 1,000. If we do this, working our way through the sample systematically at an interval of every 20, we get a sample size of 50, which is what we wanted. This is called systematic sampling. Another commonly used probability sampling method is called stratified sampling. In this method, we divide the population into homogeneous groups called strata. The groups are homogeneous in terms of a common and important characteristic, important for the study. Say, for example, you believe the population differs according to age groupings. 
Then you would separate the population into subgroups based on age. For example, we could divide the population into four age strata. Stratum 1 would be ages 18 to 24. Stratum 2 would be ages 25 to 39. Stratum 3 would be ages 40 to 54. And stratum 4 would consist of ages 55 to 70. Once these strata are created, then a random sample is taken from each stratum, or in this example, a random sample is taken from each age group. Dividing the population into homogeneous groups and then taking a random sample from each group, referred to as a stratum, is called stratified sampling. Another probability method commonly used is called cluster sampling. With a cluster sample, we divide the population into heterogeneous groups called clusters. This works well with naturally occurring groups such as cities, countries, universities, retail stores, and the like. Let's say our population is commuter universities with student populations of between 15 and 20,000 students. So we would get a list of all universities that meet this criteria. Those universities are called clusters, and then you would take a random sample of one or more of those clusters and study all the items in each of the selected clusters. These are the basic methods used in sampling today. There are many variations depending on the circumstances, but the general idea is to get a sample that is a good representation of the population you're studying. Time, money, and access to data are also important considerations when selecting a sampling method. I hope you enjoyed this tutorial on sampling methods, and I hope you learned something.